for our next Commons conversation. Uh, today we're going to be focusing on the Dome of the Rock and like the other ones listening to some strategies about how we can teach it and maybe reframe it even for our survey classes and I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Elizabeth McCauley Lewis. She is a professor at the City University of New York where she teaches classes about the archaeology of the classical, late antique, and Islamic worlds. And she also teaches, from what I can tell, really amazing classes about New York City. And I have no doubt that there will be plenty of questions. So this is just my, my continuous reminder that if you have them, to please post them in the Q&A instead of the chat, just because it makes things a little more streamlined. So with, with that, I'm going to turn over the webinar to Lizzie, and I'll pop back in at the end. So take it away, Lizzie. Uh, thank you, Lauren, for that very kind introduction. Um, and thank you also um, to Beth and Stephen for having me here today. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to share my screen um, and just get this going. Give me just a second. And we're going to go to presenter view. OK, excellent. Um, so thank you so much for having me today. Um, and thank you very much to everyone in the audience for coming along. Um, I, it gives me a chance to talk about a building that's really interesting and really important in uh, the kind of Islamic world. Um, so today, what I want to do is talk a little bit about the Dome of the Rock. Um, this is a building that was completed in 691, 692, broadly agreed upon by most scholars, by Abdul Malik, who was an Umayyad Caliph. Um, and it's a really uh, excellent building to kind of start to access and understand Islamic art and architecture. And so what I'm going to do today is kind of talk about some of the strategies I use when teaching this class, like teaching this building. Um, so the first thing is this is the earliest surviving example of monumental architecture from the Islamic world. We do have some archaeological remains of early mosques from Iraq. Um, but those are not standing living buildings. And so one of the complications around this building, which also makes it really interesting to teach, but also a challenge, is that it is a structure that is still alive. It's a living building. Um, and so unlike some of the earlier kind of works of art uh, that have been talked about, this is a building, uh, but it's also one that is very much still alive and connected to kind of geopolitical questions in the region. Um, but also it's a, it's a challenge to study a living building because living buildings are not static, they're dynamic. Um, so the, the image that you see here, which was taken, I believe in 2010, in spring 2010, um, the gold dome there was repaired in the late 1990s. Uh, the tiles that you can see are um, 20th century uh, restorations and reproductions of uh, 16th century Ottoman tiles that were put on the building by Suleiman the Magnificent or Suleiman the Lawgiver, and so who's the most Kind of important Ottoman Sultan in terms of architecture. So you can kind of see even just looking at the building how complicated it is. And so one of the strategies that I employ when uh, dealing with a living building um, or even a standing building is a kind of highly contextualized what I would call archaeological approach. Um, Germans kind of say there's a there's a great German phrase which is you're doing the archaeology of buildings which are kind of standing buildings. So I think the best way to approach the building to try and understand how it exists and what it means in the 690s um, is to look at it in a highly contextualized way, local historical, kind of urban and architectural context. Uh, the other thing that you have to do, and this is very much a function of studying anything pre-modern, is you have to be interdisciplinary with the evidence that you bring uh, to your students and to, to your analysis. In other words, we've just got to use everything we have um, because just doing a visual analysis or just looking at the sources won't really tell us everything that we want to know. Um, the other thing that I always try and emphasize is that we have to separate the building from later traditions. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about like what the building means today, but also what it may have meant in this, you know, 690s and early 8th century when it was built. So dispelling some of our assumptions. Um, and the other thing that I also think is really important when studying kind of Islamic art and architecture or just in generally is really close observations and description of details. Um, so I usually, um, if I'm teaching a small seminar, I have the students all get out pen and paper and I have them write for 10 to 15 minutes um, looking at a building. Now, since many of us are remote right now, maybe what I would recommend is having an image up on a screen and everyone in the chat kind of writing about what they think is interesting so that students take the time to really look. Um, and the last thing I usually do is also talk about calligraphy and mosaics, but particularly calligraphy, 
um, because this building is its um, inscription is so important and that helps students to orient themselves to one of those key aspects of Islamic art, which is calligraphy and the power of the word as an artistic form. Um, but the first thing I usually do is I look at historical context, um, specifically talking about kind of the Islamic conquest and the end of classical antiquity in the East. Um, just because this is not something, you know, history that maybe a lot of American students are familiar with. Um, and so just to kind of orient them to what happens in the seventh century, um, because you have the, the birth of Muhammad, his um, successful preaching, the conversion of many of the Arabs in the Hijaz, this green region here in Western Arabia to um, Islam. And then the kind of coming out of the Arabian Peninsula of these armies, uh, which you can see indicated by the black lines here. And what I think is always important to emphasize is that those Arab armies kind of come up and they run smack back, damn, smack into the Byzantine Empire and the Sasanian Empire. The Byzantine Empire is in purple over here, the Sasanian Empire, uh, in here in pink. And that's just really important because um, it helps us to contextualize kind of the artistic traditions that exist in the region so that students start to understand that, you know, the, the Arab um, armies coming out would have then seen these incredible monuments um, and these very rich building traditions of monumental architecture um, and that there were well-developed traditions of visualization. And I think that's also important because there tends to sometimes be like, okay, well, it's Islamic art, it's different. In fact, many of these early buildings are really coming out of what we call late antiquity. And so I think it's important to sometimes contextualize it that way to show that you will, you know, there's a lot of conversation between these kind of two empires um, and then this new power that's emerging. And of course the Byzantine empire will survive but truncated, the Sasanian empire will implode spectacularly, but it in fact becomes these artistic traditions and the bureaucratic traditions of the Sasanian empire that get used um, really by the Abbasids in the ninth century and later on. So in a sense, um, there's a Persianification of, of some of the, the administration of successive um, Muslim dynasties in Afghanistan, Central Asia, and Iran. Um, the other thing that's important to emphasize with understanding this period is um, the way this timeline makes it work is sometimes like it, everything is easy and simple. In fact, it is a hot mess in the second half of the seventh century. There are two major civil wars. Um, and so you have to understand the kind of politics that um, no one's, it's not clear the Umayyads are necessarily gonna win. So I usually try and really emphasize that there are pre-existing monumental architectural traditions and there is a lot of upheaval um, in, the, in the, this time. Then I usually try and look at the urban context. So, you know, kind of starting to narrow it down to get to the building. And so here you can see the Dome of the Rock um, located um, on the Temple Mount. Um, here is the um, model of uh, the old city uh, this is in the Rockefeller Museum in um, Israel today. And it's really important because I also think there's a kind of sometimes a preconceived notion that the Arab armies, you know, were not necessarily tolerant or weren't interested in other cultures or religions. And in fact, um, one of the things that's very striking about the Arab conquests are the, the amount of respect that's given to the people of the book, to, to Jews and Christians. And that takes physical form in the fact that um, a lot of the cities, so for example, here you can see the kind of many of the um, uh, Christian important buildings like the, the um, Church of the Holy Sepulchre, those are all respected. There are negotiated um, terms whenever an Arab country, um, an Arab arm, when an Arab, one of the Arab armies conquers a city. Same thing happens in Damascus, um, the Church of St. John uh, the Baptist. The cathedral there, which becomes the Great Mosque, is originally a Christian space and the Christians worship and then half of it, the Muslims have half of it, and only after a negotiated settlement um, in the early 8th century do the Christians get land to build a new church and the Muslims transform it entirely into a mosque. But the other thing that's important here, um, just to kind of dispel some of the ideas of things or kind of contentions, is the location of I talk about the location of the Dome of the Rock, and here it's located on the Temple Mount, which you can see right there. Um, and I usually emphasize that because people don't know that the Temple Mount was totally abandoned in late antiquity. It is not an important part of 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th century Jerusalem um, because uh, it basically had had a pagan 
temple on it after the successive revolts in the 70s and in the 130s. Um, but Christian Jerusalem was focused much for much for in a different part of the city, largely because um, you know Con uh, Constantine and his mother Helen were very focused on monuments associated with Christ's life. So I always like to emphasize that so people understand a little bit of the eye um, of the the kind of urban landscape. The other thing that's important is I think to have a plan, um, also because there's often a common misconception that the Dome of the Rock is a mosque. And so if you can immediately point out the Aqsa Mosque or the farthest mosque, then students kind of get like, oh, it's not a mosque. And that can kind of help them for reframing and understanding things. So I also am a big believer in the Socratic method um, and asking questions and then trying to answer the questions or prove or disprove them. So one of the questions I always ask is, you know, why was the Dome of the Rock built? And usually you get a series of these kinds of questions or answers, is it associated with Solomon? Solomon was considered um, a very important kind of model of kingship in um, the medieval period in the Islamic world and elsewhere. And of course, this is supposed to be the site of his temple. Is it tied to Abraham, who is a foundational figure in all three of the Abrahamic faiths? Um, but the most common one and the one that's associated with the building today is that it was erected to commemorate the Hijra or the night journey and Muhammad's ascent into heaven. Um, and what I usually do is I frame these questions to the students and then I said, well, here are the problems with all of them. Um, and so the commemoration of the night journey, which is most broadly accepted for today by, by um, many people, that doesn't start to emerge as a narrative in the sources until the 11th or 12th century. So the answer is in some ways the building today can have that association, but in 691, 692, it didn't. And so what I try to do is help the students to say, okay, that's true later, but it isn't in the, in the inception of the building. So how can we think about that and ask a different question? How can we understand the building at different points in its life? And so then what I do is I said, so why is it built? Why did Abdul Malik build it? What are our major arguments? And then what evidence do we have? And I really try to get into the, the nitty gritty um, and look at the architectural form and plan, the description, the inscriptions, the historical sources and the audience. Um, you know, in fact, then what I do is I say, okay, this is what we know. We know that when he was building it in the 680s, um, Abdul Malik didn't have control of Mecca and Mecca is where you're supposed to go on Hajj. Um, and so we have some sources that say he wanted to replace uh, Mecca with Jerusalem, which probably is not right because that would be such a categorical shift that it probably wouldn't pass muster with a lot of people. But the idea that it might have been a pilgrimage site where people could go and circumambulate something important would make a lot of sense. And we know that certain early mosques are oriented towards Jerusalem and then their Qibla walls change and are oriented towards Mecca. So what this hints at is that Jerusalem's really important. Um, but I also use this as an example to then say, but we're not quite sure why. And that we can't put like a nice little bow on a lot of our studies from this period. And so helping our students to understand that we don't always know as an instructor what the right interpretation is or the complete picture because we don't have it. And so I always think that that's kind of an honesty I like to do. And that immediately then kind of gets into this next thing that I often show them, which is I look at plans. I like the students to be able to read plans, to understand plans. Um, but then I also use this when I'm talking about connecting it back to the Kaaba, I can say, well, you have two aisles. So you can see that people can walk around this rock. There is no clear kind of apps, niche, Qibla, Mihrab. There's no straight orientation, which is really weird in a lot of buildings. And so to me, looking at the architecture of the building, I say that to me is compelling when combined with the historical sources. And then usually at this point, a student says, so what does the rock represent? I go, I don't know. I don't know, we don't actually really know. And that's one of the conundrums in, in studying this building. That said, we can say that the rock is important. And so what I do to then help the students think about why the rock could be important and what it could mean is by then comparing it to other examples of religious architecture in the region. And some of our best comparanda are for slightly earlier churches. So this is the church of the Cathisma. Um, this is where Mary is thought to have rested on a rock on her way to Bethlehem. And what's really interesting is that it is also an octagonal shape. Um, this shows a later phase when um, the outer ambulatory were converted into chapels and actually the church is later converted into a mosque. Um, but when I show the students this, they go, oh, wow. 
And I think what makes it helpful is they're learning to look at plans and get used to trying to read plans, um, but also that they can then see the role of archeology. span And I always usually point out that these, this ex these excavations were done within the last 20 years. And so we still are always learning and we can still change our interpretations because there may be more evidence. There's further evidence that we have, they have spectacular mosaics on the floor. Um, and then I usually also show them this plan so that they can start to understand how the architecture looks. So then this helps me to then segue into the next kind of part when I'm trying to lead them towards an interpretation where I say, okay, it's clearly in communication with local churches and building in a similar way. Well, in fact, maybe the other point of the building is also to show that Islam is able to build monumental architecture and articulate the validity of its religion through architecture and phenomenal monumental structures. And so it's not surprising that in fact, the building is kind of in direct conversation um, with the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, the church built over the site of where Christ's tomb was supposed to be. been. Um, and this has a, a, a spectacular dome here. You can see um, it was restored um, and kind of spectacular look, but the size of the dome of the rock is almost identical to the size of the dome of the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. So then you can start to get the students thinking and looking about, oh, well, maybe there's a kind of competitive landscape of religion. And, you know, did a lot of people convert immediately or not? And then that opens it to an interesting conversation of what is the audience for these buildings? Um, I usually also then show them a base plan just so that students can see that this is the old plan of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Um, it's now much more truncated uh, due to later medieval damage and restoration. Um, and then usually also seeing the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem is another good indicator to kind of show this nature of circular or octagonal churches and the reason. Now, the other reason I like to, to show these to students is to also help them to reframe and rethink what we know about buildings. Because traditionally, if we were talking about this building you know, 20, well, not 25, but maybe 50 years ago, the, the models that were given for its architecture were all in Italy. Um, it was San Vitale in Ravenna. It was Hadrian's mausoleum, or as you can see here, Augustus's mausoleum. And so one of the things that I think is important is also shifting this idea of the building has to be looking somehow to Europe. There aren't local precedents. And I think that that reminds us to try and reframe and think about other ways of looking at Islamic art and architecture. It shouldn't always be in reference to kind of not only European models. Um, and so I just try to show that to the students so that they can start to think about different links as well. Now, of course, and I'm gonna go a little bit longer, um, we go inside the building because you can't not look at the interior. And this is where um, mosaics and calligraphy and inscriptions really come into their own. Um, and so here you can see uh, the very famous inscription. Uh, this inscription gives us the date. Um, Abdul Malik's name was removed um, because the later someone else who was restoring it later put his name in first, but it dates to 691, 692. So it's broadly agreed that Abdul Malik built the building. Um, but the thing that's so important about the inscription is it really establishes writing and calligraphy as an art form. And that's really important to emphasize because again, that is not considered to be the highest art form in what is traditionally considered the kind of canon of Western or European um, art and architecture. Um, and so I think it's really important to emphasize that to students that words are a form of artistry. Um, again, that makes a lot of sense in the context of seventh century Arabia where poetry was considered the highest art form. Um, and so this is where we can see kind of pre-Islamic Arabian culture mixing with the monumental traditions of, um, you know, the kind of Mediterranean, Byzantine, and Sasanian world. Um, but I usually also then always print off a copy or share a copy of the whole inscription, which is 240 meters with my students, and I get them to read it. Um, there are certain phrases that they will start to recognize, the Bishmala and the Shahada, which are key parts of kind of uh, the, the Islamic faith. But also there are Quranic verses, non-Quranic verses in the text. And there's a lot of discussion about Christ and Mary and whether or not Christ is divine, which is a big preoccupation in early Islam. But it's a great way for the students to start to look at the text and see how religion is related 
to images and iconography, but also to get them used to like, okay, we've looked at the architecture, we've looked at the words, and now we're going to look at the decoration. So I usually always show them mosaics as well. Um, mosaics are usually something people are very comfortable looking at. Um, and also, I often show some of these images with this really rich acanthus um, and the grapes because most students who have studied any ancient art, um, Mediterranean ancient art, or Byzantine art will immediately recognize and connect to some of this material. Um, and I almost always show it in conjunction with um, slightly earlier mosaics. These are mosaics from different churches in uh, Jordan. Uh, again, that's to emphasize the, the power of local creativity. This um, does not have to be borrowed from you know, Rome. Um, I also then usually pull out a very famous text that's associated with the building. This is again, I think a 12th century text um, which claims that Abdul Malik demanded that the Byzantine Empire send him mosaicists to work um, on the Dome of the Rock. And um, this text is now really not regarded as being a valid historical source because it makes no sense. Um, why would Abdul Malik, who's just won a series of victories, um, demand mosaicists, and why would the Byzantine emperor send them? So I help students to kind of try and think about that, but then I also in conjunction say, ah, but you can see we have all this mosaics here in the region beforehand, um, and that those mosaics are really, really rich, so why do you need them from Byzantium? And the other thing is that we have papyrological evidence for our artisans coming from Egypt um, uh, who were working there, and we have uh, gold and green mosaics in Saqqara in Egypt. So then what I try and do is say, ah, oh, look, we have another types of sources to use. We have, you know, papyri, which are kind of administrative records. So we can compare that to the sources. So I'm trying to get them to do source criticism along with that. Um, I also usually show them this image because this has Sasanian wing crowns. And so again, part of the reframing of trying to take this away from a solely kind of European conversation is to show how some of these artistic forms relate to earlier Sasanian forms. Um, and then lastly, I usually then take the Dome of the Rock or the Great Mosque in Damascus if I'm teaching that, <clears throat> and I like to reframe it in the context of some of the caliphal residences and palaces because one of the assumptions that students often come into uh, a classroom about Islamic art is that everything is aniconic and that figural forms are not permitted. And so what I usually do here is I show this picture. This is thought to be an image of a standing caliph. Um, there are standing caliphs on actually early um, Islamic coins before the coins become entirely aniconic. Um, and this mosaic um, from Kerbet Mafjar, which shows um, a lion and deer. And so I also usually try and show students these images to say, okay, religious art in is the Islamic tradition is absolutely aniconic, but they didn't get the memo on that for the rest of the building. So how do we think more critically about our assumptions? How do we look more critically? And can we also really start to understand the kind of really richness of uh, this tradition? Um, so I think with that, I'm going to pause since I was a little bit longer than I meant to be. Um, but thank you very much. And I think Lauren will um, organize the questions. Thanks so much, Lizzie. This is this is really great. I love the the many pointed attempts at reframing and, and really complicating people's assumptions that they bring um, to to this very complex monument. Let's see, I'm going to spotlight myself here. So I just wanted to invite people to ask their questions. And um, as they're doing that, I, I wanted to ask, you know, I think you, 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 you mentioned some of the complications or the, at least the challenges that you have with students. And I'm wondering if, you know, do you ever experience when you're teaching the Dome of the Rock that, that students can feel discombobulated or even overwhelmed by the, by the, the kind of sheer amount of things that just the Dome of the Rock itself presents you with, but also these many, uh, many, many connections that you, I think, so beautifully raised. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I have to say, when I, when I was first trying to understand the building, I just sat there and I was like, oh my gosh, this is so, just so darn complicated. Um, yes, and so what I usually try and do is, um, sometimes if I'm gonna get to this building, I like to do as much work as I can on kind of late antiquity, just to warm people up to the idea that there isn't a hard, it's, you know, a hard and, fast stop, that there's this fluidity and there's a lot of change going on already. Um, and then I usually 
so I usually will spend some time going through the history or making sure that the, the history and some of the other monuments that this building could be in conversation with our, our, our kind of students feel comfortable with them. Um, I usually spend a lot of time on this building because you kind of need a lot of time to, to do it justice. I mean, the Great Mosque in Damascus, which is another one that often gets taught, um, is more straightforward in a certain way. Like it's a mosque, it has, you know, a Qibla wall, it has the layering that's so typical of conversion of holy sites in, um, you know, the Levant or the, the Middle East, um, but it's a mosque and it, you know, it does what it's supposed to do. This building, the fact that we don't really fully understand what it does makes it really hard. And so I usually then try and connect it to say also some of the desert, um, these what they used to be called desert castles, but they're more now kind of considered palatial residences because people, if you coming from ancient art, like you'll know about villas, you'll know about palaces. And so trying to find those points of connection and that's where the mosaics I think are also really helpful because people are like, oh, it's acanthus. I've seen that before. Um, yeah, sorry, that's a long answer. No, I think that's, that's great. And it actually it caused me to think of another question that someone else just asked. And so I think it's a good one. And that is that, you know, this, this is such a pedagogically rich site. And so how much time do you usually spend to get all these kind of points across, say, you know, a whole class period beyond that? I mean, it, when I, when I'm not teaching a class that's like early Islamic art and architecture, I still try and give it a fair amount of time. I mean, I could give this a two hour seminar with no problem, but that's not realistic for most people. But I think you need to give it at least if you're in a lecture or um, some type, if you're in a discussion section, I think it needs a half an hour of lecture or maybe 45 minutes of discussion. And maybe the way to do it is um, some of the readings, there are enough readings in English um, but it could be that you assign certain things for different students, like maybe students read all one thing, but you know, somebody's responsible for talking about the inscription, somebody's responsible for talking about some of the mosaics, somebody's responsible for talking about the church of the cathisma. Um, because that way then you can kind of get enough of those different pieces together. But I think it's a building that if you were willing to give Hagia Sophia 45 minutes, this building should get the same amount of time. And in terms of importance in, in an alternative, in a different tradition, it's there. I mean, we still get green and blue or green and gold mosaics in the houses I worked on in, in Syria that are from, you know, 18th, 19th century. Apologies for my dog shaking. <laughs> I just decided she needed to get up. So apologies for her making a little bit of noise. Um, so I think though it really, I think also it can help students to really understand like how impressive the building traditions are in the Islamic world. And so if you've never had any, I think it, it allows you to go like, wow, this is a really rich artistic tradition too. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And we have a couple more questions that I think take us in a new direction. Um, one is about Kerbet and it, 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 the question is, it, it reminds me of Sassanian royal art and how much of Sassanian art was taken as an influence um, in Islamic art. Sassanian, Sassanian art is really important. Um, and that is one of the things that's it's really worth emphasizing and that there are the very rich figural traditions that exist in Sasanian and pre-Islamic Iran and Central Asia really do continue onwards and upwards. So even if you're in Central Asia and you're looking at Sogdian material culture, the fact that there's real interest in kind of putting patterns all over all surfaces, which you can see in the Dome of the Rock here, that's really important. And so the, while this building in some ways draws more on some of the mosaic and monumental tradition, traditions of the Eastern Mediterranean. I mean, I think you can make a good case for a lot of Egyptian influence or workmanship in this building. Um, I usually almost always show the, um, the winged crowns uh, to emphasize that with this building, there's immediately a Sasanian connection, even if it's not as pronounced in this building as in other works of art. But if I, then I'm talking about some like Kerbet Mafjar, if you talk about Kosa Amra, which is another one of these caliphal residences, there's a setting where you have the kind of caliph with other kings of kings. And so the idea of kings of kings is very much an ancient Persian idea, but you know, the Shah is there. So there's definitely that connection. Um, and that is also more pronounced as you look at more of the art and architecture that's in 
um, Iraq, Iran, and moving towards Central Asia. So it's also trying to kind of tee up that idea that you know, we look at it often in the United States as being in the Middle East, you could look at it as being in Western Asia, and that that's often something I say, like geographically just saying like, we're in Western Asia, we're not in the Middle East. If that's the case, then how do we look at things? I, I mean, I, I think that's such a, I, I love the, the, I feel like I've learned so many things today in terms of thinking about this extra richness and repositioning. So this is great. My brain is going in so many different directions. Um, <laughs> We have a couple of really great questions coming in. Um, one uh, from Stephen is, has modern politics complicated or enriched the teaching of this monument, which I think is such a good question. It's always complicated because it's not a building you really can visit easily, even if you're there. Um, it, it is complicated because, um, you know, the, these buildings under, um, you know, this building is technically under um, the PLO, um, you know, the Palestinian Authority. Um, and it's not easily accessible. Um, going to visit some of the sites is even really challenging. I mean, before COVID, it was challenging to go um, to these sites. So I think, but that said, our excavations have continued, work has continued um, pre-COVID in, in these locations. Um, I think when you, I, I, one of the things I'm kind of at pains when I said, you know, it's built on the Temple Mount because the Temple Mount's not important in late antiquity because it's an abandoned zone. It's just to help people understand that, you know, it's not, the thing is the Temple Mount's the best piece of property that has the highest elevation. And your primary, primary population in, you know, um, the 690s and 680s in um, Jerusalem is Christian. So I try to kind of weed out like, what do we know and try and say, okay, these are, this is what exists today, but the situation was really different. Um, and so trying to pick that apart and help students see that it's not, that the patterns that exist today were not replicated in the past and trying to just help people pick those apart um, so that they can disassociate some of those questions. Then there's the whole interesting question, um, I think, which is a slightly different one, which is the way that some of these monuments function in national narratives and archeological narratives. Um, you know, particularly for Jordan pre-1967, there's real interesting questions. Um, also, if you're interested in tourism, the tourism dynamics and kind of the presentation of the Holy Land, particularly to American evangelical tourists who want to go to the Holy Land, um, that's not so much about this monument, but that kind of affects the whole region and the emphasis on importance of monuments. Um, so that's kind of a different one. Um, I've been fortunate that people have been really receptive and interested to learn about the building um, and students have asked good questions about it, I think. Um, so, yeah. Well, and following up on that, I mean, when you've, when you've gone to the Dome of the Rock, you know, did it affect uh, how, like, did it help you understand it better to actually see it in person and experience it in person? I think it's always better to see a building in person if you can. You get different senses of buildings um, and you can't get a full sense of something not having been there. Um, it's imperfect because you really can't get to lots of structures. So this is a building that I've wanted to go see. I actually have never gotten to go there because um, I've done a lot of work in Damascus, but I, you can't go from Damascus to Israel. Um, you can go from Jordan, but this is one I still haven't had to had a chance to be able to go and see. So that's the other thing that's hard and I'll be, I'm always very honest about it. Um, I'm teaching it with the experts and knowledge of colleagues who have been there. Um, it's really imperfect, um, but it is what it is. And when you teach it with, with that in mind, I mean, are you often introducing students in as much depth as the what we know about the earlier period? Are you talking also about, say, um, are you talking in as much detail about the later development, say, the Ottoman contexts as well? Um, I sometimes do and sometimes don't. It depends on how much time I have. Um, and so I often will do like a suggested reading like if you want to read about all of the changes in the 16th century, I do usually assign one article that talks about a lot of the later associations and when those kind of pop, kind of pop up so that students start to get used to the idea that they can't, that, that some of their assumptions need to be challenged. But so <laughs> I usually do that by having them read something. As we have a couple more 
questions if you're if you're okay with staying on yeah. a little bit longer okay so the the other one uh that we have is you know do you think that the borrowing of the byzantine you know gem images or other details was done as a form of competition this this idea that you said that you know the the competitive landscape of religion do you think that that borrowing was intended to outdo the byzantine visual culture like in some form of competition yeah, I think I think it is at some level, even though there's not widespread conversion until really later in the eighth and in particularly the ninth century um, in terms of local populations to Islam. I think it's very much a, a, a physical articulation of the fact that Islam is here to stay and it has a visual and architectural tradition that is as monumental and as impressive as the, the Byzantine world. Um, and having your dome be as big as the dome of the uh, of the church of the holy sepulchre in the same landscape but elevated up on a higher platform you know is a very big way of saying it because one of the questions and also things that people debate is like who's allowed inside mm -hmm. um and so that question is who's allowed inside and if christians aren't allowed inside why did you spend all that time saying that christ can't be the son of god um, but okay, maybe that's right. Maybe you only show select dignitaries, the building inside, but the exterior, everybody can see. And if it's in an elevated position, everybody can see that. And that makes a very public statement in the urban context. So that's where I go back into this question of context and understanding the city and the landscape of the city in the 690s. I think that's such an important point that you mentioned, like who was allowed into this building and why go to all the trouble of these inscriptions that mention that about Christ, right, if if not. And that actually segues perfectly to our last question, which is about the inscriptions inside the building. And, you know, could you speak a bit more about how you how you introduce students or walk them through the extensive texts inside and, you know, are there specific prompts or strategies that you use to that, especially for students who might be, you know, I would think unfamiliar with this. So I usually use, um, Oleg Grabar um, has a very good translation in his short book about the Dome of the Rock. So I must always photocopy that or make a scan of that. Um, and I, so that's the first thing I do. So they have it, they read it, they look at it. And then I kind of usually say, let's let's talk about it. Why, are, why do we think some of the verses are from the Quran and not from the Quran? Have, you know, most people hold the view that the Quran was um, codified in 648 under Uthman. Not everybody agrees. But you know, let's look at the language. These are theological arguments. You know, why do they care so much about Mary and Christ? Um, and really, you know, this is the thing: if if Islam is really monotheistic, is Christianity really monotheistic? And that's the kind of, in some ways, we have questions around the dogma. Like, why is it so focused on Christ? Because in that moment, Christ is really so important. If we think about all the debates that go on about like his essence in Christianity, you know, in the three, 400 years before this period, it's feeding into some of those ideas. So I do that and I really try and get them to, to kind of understand it. But then also I usually spend time on it to try and elevate the text. I know that's the thing that normally in most cases as an archeologist, I'm like, no text, we don't want to deal with the text. The text <laughs> um, but this becomes an idea of where text is really important. So I usually ask them to pick out passages to look at them, it's not very long, it's maybe two and a half pages typed um, to see what themes that they see emerging. And so I usually have prompts like, you know, what does this tell you about the view of Mary, about the view of Christ? Who do we think can, can see this? Um, also, if people can see it, who can read it? Because, you know, if most of your population might have been speaking Greek or Aramaic or other languages like that, You've written it in Arabic. Who's who can who can read it, and does that matter too? So, kind of getting them to think through some of those questions as well. So that goes back to this issue of audience again, and how visible are they? You know, if you're on the ground, what can you see? Um, so those are usually some of the things where I try and examine the text as both a text, but also as kind of an artistic form on a building. Well, this is great. That that I really liked your answer to this last question because now I feel like I need to to completely reframe how I teach this the next time I do it. So this is very exciting. And thank you so much for guiding us through this very complicated <laughs> building. <laughs> and I'm sure you could talk about it for many more hours. Um, and thank you to everyone for coming. If you have more questions for Lizzie, I encourage you to bring them to our Facebook group, The Smart History Commons, or, or get in touch with us. But for now, we'll, we'll let Lizzie go and say thank you. And uh, we look forward to seeing folks for the next one. So again, thanks, Lizzie.
Thank you. Bye.